Welcome. My name is David Zatuni. I'm the co-chair of Greenberg Trials United States Data Privacy and Security Practice, and I want to welcome everybody to the second annual CCPA conference. It's an honor to be giving the keynote address, and I really hope everybody has a great day with great material about the CCPA, and now I should say the CPRA and Proposition 24. So I want to tell you a little bit about my practice, which is going to go into what I'm going to be talking today about the keynote. I've been practicing data privacy and security for about 18 years and have helped hundreds of companies design privacy programs, help companies with auditors and compliance managers, um, and defend programs before regulators and before trial attorneys. One of the questions that I am always asked, either by the company itself or by an auditor, or I see references to, is what is standard practice? And that's what I'm going to focus my presentation on today and our discussion today not just about the CCPA. Hopefully everybody who is um, attending this conference knows about the CCPA and you're gonna be hearing a lot of information today about what it means to be compliant and different types of practices, but specifically focusing on industry standards, meaning what are companies actually doing? So let's jump right into it. If you look at the agenda, I'm gonna talk about what industry standard practices are and what they're not, and a little bit about some confusion around the term. I'll talk about an overview of what is a CCPA compliance program, which hopefully shouldn't be new to that many people who are attending the program. And finally, I'm gonna delve into actual statistics about what companies are doing, um, both in terms of those requirements of the CCPA and also those areas where compliance is a little bit ambiguous and there's a lot of discretion in terms of how you interpret the CCPA. So with that, let's get started. A word about industry standard practices. And if you look on page three of the materials, you'll see what I did is try to contrast what standard practices are and what they are not. And this may seem very obvious to some, but I can tell you there's a whole lot of confusion when you use the term industry standard practice to an auditor or to somebody in business, whether it's a CEO or CFO or CTO. So what is it? The very simple definition, something done regularly by a large segment of an industry without objection. That doesn't mean that the entire industry is doing it. it doesn't even mean that half the industry is doing it, but it has to be a large segment of the industry. So what isn't it? And where do you get confusion about what industry standard practice is and what it's not? It is not majority practice necessarily. Sometimes you can find industry standards that are just large components, 30% of an industry or 40% of an industry. It doesn't necessarily have to hit the 50% threshold. It's not necessarily leading practice. The term leading practice is a little bit more normative. It has um, a little bit more value judgment put into it about what is leading versus non-leading. And sometimes when people use that word leading, what they really mean is best practices, something that they're trying to espouse to. But sometimes what is a leading practice to one person might not occupy much of an industry segment, meaning you could find 1% or 2% of companies doing the leading practice. And it's also not best practice. It's also not necessarily compliant practices. So there's a number of situations I could tell you over my 18 years of practice where the industry standard practice was a non-compliant practice, not to the CCPA, of course, but to other data privacy or security laws, meaning you can't just assume that because a lot of people are doing it, it's necessarily legally compliant. What are compliant practices? So let me just set that up a little bit for those who are trying to struggle and say, well, what's the difference between a compliant practice and a standard practice? Well, defining compliance is pretty easy. It's interpreting a statute, and it means looking at the text for the CCPA of 1798.100, it also means looking at the regulations, the legislative history, the interpretive history, committee notes, meetings and findings, and the real goal of compliant practices is really to decide what a court would likely interpret the CCPA is requiring. Compliance is often not binary. It's often a spectrum of risks. Sometimes there can be more than one compliance solution, or sometimes there can be no compliance solution, but compliance strategies about guesses of what courts would hold to be compliant. So, to put that as juxtaposition of what an industry standard practice is, standards are different. Standards are objective review of what's happening in an industry. Standard practices are not necessarily binary. So as I said before, sometimes a majority of an industry is doing something, sometimes it's not. Sometimes you can see that there's five, 10, 15 different standards um, practices that are happening within an industry. And then the question becomes, why are they important? I can tell you as an attorney who's been practicing for a long time, that there's really nothing more powerful, particularly to business people, about what are my competitors doing? What is the rest of the industry doing? Even if you try to explain and, and walk them through the fact that just because others are doing it doesn't necessarily make it compliant. But what is it that they've keyed into that makes them so focused on standard practices? Well, part of it is that there's truth to the saying that there's safety in numbers. If you're the only person doing something, whether it's right or wrong, you're more likely to stand out, be noticed for that practice that can be good or bad. 
There's also a natural psychological inclination to do what other people are doing. It's in our nature that if we see a group doing something, we assume that what they're doing is probably right or at least less risky. So those are the good parts about standard practices. What are the bad parts? They can be dangerous. People and organizations really overestimate or often overestimate the safety of being in the herd. Sometimes practices diverge between industries such that you may be in a majority position within a sub-industry, but you might be in a minority position within a larger industry. And so this is a word of caution. You may think that you're part of an industry standard practice, but a lot of that depends on which industry you're looking at and how you define an industry can itself be a bit of a debate. How you define it might be different from how a competitor defines it might also be different from how a judge defines it or a regulator defines it. And you have to look for situations in which there's sub-industries. And one example that I'll talk about is retail, but I could pick 10 or 15 different ones, that they are doing something which may look like they're part of a herd. It may look like it is the majority position, but when you back up and compare them to either the, the meta industry, all companies or other industries that are similarly situated, you find very divergent practices between the two. So when you really start thinking about, well, what's standard practice, a lot of it has to deal with your denominator. Who are you looking at? And companies tend to overweight the importance of their industry. So in that analysis, where you may have a sub-industry doing something and then a larger industry doing something else, what I've often found is that companies themselves overweight what their immediate competitors are doing. And I use the term overweight to mean they give more weight than sometimes what others would give, particularly judges, regulators, or plaintiffs. How can I boil all this down? Well, if you see on page six of the materials, I put up a graphic and I think this just sums it up. When you're talking about standard practices, on one hand, you've got the herd effect, the idea that we're, there's safety in the herd. If we pack together and do what everybody else is, we won't go noticed. On the flip side of it, you also have the jumping off the ridge effect. If one person jumps off a cliff and everybody's jumping off of a cliff, does that mean you should jump off a cliff? You have to balance these when talking about industry standards. So let me talk a little bit about the statistics you're going to see today. Um, one thing, anytime you look at industry standards, you always have to look at the source. Where are they coming from? So I'm going to tell you what our source was, and, and you should realize that as you start seeing what I talk about and put it in context. So we looked at every company in the Fortune 500. We did it around February. So it was about a month or two months after the CCPA officially went into, uh, went into effect, but before it was enforceable by the California Attorney General. And we looked at everything. We looked at privacy notices. We looked at privacy representations, do not sell links, cookie, ad tech deployments, cookie banners, opt-in banners, opt-out banners, functioning banners. Um, and what we were really looking for was what are companies within the Fortune 500 doing? We also looked at it only from a California IP address, meaning there are some companies and we're aware of them who have different practices. If you visit a website in California, you will get a different view. You'll get a different actual site to playing than if you visit it from anywhere outside of California. That's our data set. So keep that in mind. What I will say in terms of pros and cons, we chose the Fortune 500 because it's a very knowable and recognizable data set. On the flip side, it's the Fortune 500. Every company on there has over a billion dollars in revenue. They all have compliance departments, sophisticated legal departments, internal risk and internal audit. Most of them are publicly audited. Most of them are publicly traded. So as a result, take it with a grain of salt that what is standard practice for them may not be the same thing as standard practice for an emerging company or a startup. So very quickly, if you look on page eight of the materials, you'll see a very high level diagram, which just summarizes the CCPA. Um, I'm not gonna get into each one of these other than to say, and I, I know it's a little small print, on the left-hand side, you'll see a column that has the core requirements of what the CCPA requires. That's the law. On the right-hand side, you'll see a reduction of the eight functional policies or procedures that I would view as being pretty common among companies that are trying to set up CCPA compliance programs. Doesn't mean these are the only eight, and I'm sure anybody who's audited a company who's doing a CCPA program has seen some companies with four and other companies with 20 or 30 different policies. But these eight are immediately recognizable. Privacy notices, data subject request policies or protocols, policies around selling practices, written information security policies. I'm going to talk today and really focus on four of them. And they're the four most outwardly visible, outwardly facing policies. The reason I chose those is because it is easier to find objective industry benchmarking for those. Um, this is not based just on the couple hundred programs that I've seen. It's not based on the couple hundred programs somebody else has seen. This is based on what is actually viewable and you can benchmark it across companies. Things like privacy notices or seeing data subject request protocols, at least how they play out, are things that can be benchmarked fairly easily.
So let's jump straight into it and let's talk about privacy notices. So before talking about benchmarking, let me remind everybody what is required by the CC CCPA when you talk about privacy notices. So the quick summary, and there are a lot of requirements, but here are some of the high level ones, which I think are industry interesting when you start doing benchmarking. So first, the CCPA required that all privacy notices be updated to include the rights of Californians to access their information and delete information. It also required, and this was a little bit more unique because that first component for a privacy notice that had been updated for the GDPR would already be there, talking about access rights and deletion rights, at least if a company extended them beyond Europe. The second component though is very unique to the CCPA. CCPA listed out 13 specific data fields, personal identifiers, um, biometric information, health information. And it said for each of these, a company must disclose whether they're collected, whether they're shared and whether they're sold. And so one of the things we looked at in terms of benchmarking is, was there a privacy notice? Was it updated? Did it talk about the rights? And did it break everything down by the 13 enumerated data fields? Before I jump into those substantive issues, if you look on page 10, you'll see just something that will give you a little bit of a, a baseline in terms of understanding even the complexities of privacy notices. And this is just size. So average privacy notice size, 3,900 words. Shortest, 88 words. Longest, about 11,000 words. That is a huge variation, huge. That's the difference between some companies having a half a page privacy notice and some companies having a 40 page privacy notice with the average privacy notice being that 3,900 or 4,000 word level. Um, so one takeaway from here, even when you start talking about the Fortune 500, these are all sophisticated companies, presumably with legal counsel and auditors compliance and some of them with a privacy unit, huge variations in terms of how they handled the length of the privacy notice and what they described. Then you jump into the enumerated category issues. So as I summarized, the CCPA required all companies that are within its purview, and we all know about you know, what's covered by the CCPA, to disclose by enumerated category. That was a new concept, a new term, and something that wouldn't have existed before the CCPA companies would not have done it. Well, as of February of this year, 38% of companies did not disclose their practices by enumerated category, no reference to it, meaning they just didn't break it down by the 13 categories required by the CCPA. That's over one third. So when you start talking about industry standards, one could argue one of the industry standards, at least as of February, was not to have updated your privacy notice to do enumerated category disclosures. Now, again, this is why I start off by talking about compliance versus industry standards. Would it be compliant not to have updated your uh, privacy notice? I'll, I'll leave that to all the lawyers who are attending, like myself, to draw their own conclusions. But I can tell you that it was about a third of companies which had not done that update. Now, we've looked at these statistics more recently than February. Um, some of these have shrunk, but I think people would still be surprised at the quantity of companies that still have not done certain updates and certain changes. And then the remainder, you know, about 60% had done some update. And one thing that we cataloged here, and you'll see it on page 11, is whether or not those are being conveyed to consumers in charts and lists or tables, or just listed out where they would just kind of do it in prose all the way through. And even there, you see that there's really not a specific standard which has emerged. Um, of the remaining component that actually did an update, you had 38% which disclosed in charts. So again, about a third. And then you had about 24% which just listed out the information. We collect colon, we sell colon all the way through. So in terms of the summary of where standard practices have left us on the privacy notice front, here's the takeaway. A significant minority of websites did not make an attempt to update that their privacy notices to comply with the CCPA. That um, quantity decreased so much by August when the final regulations came out, but it still is out there that there are privacy notices that have still not been updated. Among those companies that did update, about 38% were arguably facially non-compliant for failing to disclose enumerated categories. And again, keep in mind with all of this, this is the Fortune 500. These are not startups, these are fairly large companies. And you had almost 40% which had not done enumerated category disclosures. And then finally, some privacy notices approached 40 pages long at the outward edge, and other privacy notices were half page. So again, if you were doing an audit of somebody's privacy practices, keep these in mind. Um, it's one thing to talk about a company about what a leading practice is or what your recommendation is, but be careful when you talk about industry standards, even on things as, long, as far as how long a privacy notice is. Um, I think what you'll see is that there's a lot of divergence when it comes to the privacy notices and what companies have done.
So let's talk a little bit about data subject requests. Just a quick reminder to everybody in terms of background, there's three main types of data subject requests that can be made under the CCPA. You've got your access to personal information, and that can be for specific pieces of information or categories, category level information. You've got deletion of personal information. And then finally, you have opt out of sale of information. I'll talk more about that one a little bit separately. In terms of summarizing some of the requirements, and you'll see this on page 14, you have to offer Californians the ability to access their information. You have to offer Californians the ability to delete their information. If a company sells that information, they have to have the ability to opt out of the sale. And for most companies, you also have to talk about what you do in terms of submitting the request, meaning having a toll-free number to submit a request and an email address or an online portal or something to take it electronically. So let's talk about statistics and see what the industry standard is. On page 15, you'll see the first one that I noted, disclosure of access and deletion rights. This was interesting. 82% of companies, so this is higher than the number of companies that had done enumerated category level disclosure, 82%, eight out of 10, disclosed access and deletion rights to Californians. Why was this higher than some of the other issues? GDPR is the answer. Some privacy notices had not updated for the CCPA, but they had updated for GDPR and they did so in a jurisdiction agnostic, or as we call it, future-proofing way, meaning they had given certain rights. Those rights were not restricted to Europe. They were being driven by the GDPR. And that's the bleed over. I would suggest at least as of February, if you looked at those companies that had just updated for the CCPA, this number would have been closer to 60 or 70%. There were another 10% of companies which had tried to future-proof when they had done their GDPR um, updates. So what's the standard here? There is a standard that has emerged, which is companies are offering access and deletion rights. At least deletion on that screen, access numbers are about the same. If you look at page 16, you can see a little bit about do not sell. If you ask me what's the number one place where I've seen auditors get it wrong, or companies get it wrong about what industry standard practice is, it's here. It's about the do not sell link. I've heard some people say that it is the, the industry standard. Everybody's doing it. I've heard others say nobody's doing it. I've heard others say that, you know, if you don't do it, you're not compliant, period. Now, none of those are really true. So let's talk about what the standard is. Among companies that disclose that they sell information. So this is just looking at the population that say, I sell. The percentage that include the do not sell link was about 80%. What does this tell us? Most companies that are disclosing that they sell information are complying with the requirement that there be a do not sell link at the bottom of their webpage and in a privacy notice. But again, it's eight out of 10, and this was as of February of 2020. Two out of 10, 20%, were saying, I sell, and they weren't putting up the do not sell link. But still, I think you could conclude here, the industry standard practice is if you sell information, put up the do not sell link. The more interesting number, and I think I have this a little bit later on in the program, is how many companies said they sold information in the first place. And I'll talk about that in the next section. And that's one where I think I, I've really heard people miss the boat in terms of what industry standards are. So in terms of summary, what could industry standard practices tell us about data subject requests? Well, a few things. Most companies have complied with the requirement to offer a toll-free number. A larger than expected percentage of companies decided to use online request submission pages, one trust tool, trust arc tool, where people can type into a form and submit it. About 50% of companies retained a third party to host those and about the other 50% were doing it internally. Those are things I didn't put the actual statistics for, but those are some other takeaways in terms of other data points. Outward facing compliance when it comes to data subject access and deletion rights is high, that's good. The ability to effectuate access and deletion requests in a timely manner, however, is still an open question, and that would be an area where there's potential risk. That is a harder one to benchmark. And I'll tell you, we've tried a couple of times to see if we could benchmark that. But the a degree of disparity and divergence in terms of how people treat data subject access requests and deletion requests is fairly large. The degree of um, to which the statute actually allows you to take different positions on it is also fairly large. <laughs> So think of things like, what are the requirements to do a verification? Um, some companies is less, some companies it's more, some that have more may be longer in terms of how long it takes to verify internally, how long it takes to get back to an individual. Um, volume, some companies have received very little, some companies have received a lot. That also I think is dictating in terms of how fast we will respond back. There's a lot of variables there that make it hard to hit standard practice. So let me talk a little bit of, again in this kind of dovetails off of the data subject rights, but specifically about selling practices. And I mentioned before, this is bar none, 
the most interesting part of, I think, industry standards. So a quick recap and summary. Um, under the CCPA, and when you think about best practices, a business has to disclose whether it sells personal information. It's a requirement of the CCPA. It doesn't say that you have to put a do not sell link. It says you have to say whether you are selling. If you are selling, you put the do not sell link. If you're not selling, you don't necessarily have to. So what else do you have to do if you are selling? Well, you have to disclose by enumerated category what data is being sold. So it's not enough to say we sell information. Once you say that, you have to say, well, we sell information, including the following categories of information and go through the 13 categories that are listed in the CCPA. And then post a do not sell my personal information link and honor requests that are made for your information not to be sold. So if you wanna talk about benchmarking and standards, start on page 20. You can see here, I've listed disclosure of sale of personal information. And as I hinted at before, I have seen this area more than all others being misdescribed by people who I think are speculating about what they think standard practices have been, either from their own experience online or from dealing with certain companies, but not really stepping back objectively. So what is the standard in practice? Well, it was very clear as of February. And I think I can tell you from looking at more recent data, it remains pretty clear that the majority of companies state they do not sell personal information. That's not that they put a do not sell link. So let me say it again. The majority of companies say, we just do not sell. They do not offer a do not sell option because they are not selling. And when you look at this, there's a couple of other interesting um, things you can pull out of the benchmarking. One could argue the industry standard, at least in the entirety of the Fortune 500, is about 60% of companies saying we don't sell. Well, how many companies do sell? It's not 40%. So as of February, 30% of companies were silent. They didn't say whether they sold, they didn't say whether they didn't sell. And you can get into a debate about whether that silence in of itself is consistent with the CCPA. But I think objectively what you can see is a significant number, a third, have taken the position that they're not taking a position, that they're simply going to avoid the requirement to disclose. And then about 10% of companies, one in 10, said that they sold information. That's really relevant. Um, I've heard from some auditors, I've heard from some consultants who have said, well, every company is saying they sell information. And that's just not the case. It's about one in 10, a little bit larger now that you can fast forward from February. But again, I would argue it's probably still in the minority. So if you look on page 21, you start deeper diving into selling practices, you get into that phenomenon I talked about at the beginning, where you can have different practices in different industries. So you look at the entirety of the Fortune 500, 60% of companies say we don't sell. Look at a sub industry though, and the one I put on the screen is retail. Among retailers, about 60% said, no, we do sell. And about 27% said, we don't sell. So when you look at that, I'd say two things about the retail sector. One is there's two industry standards. Um, you have one in four companies still saying they do not sell information. That's a minority, but that is an appreciable minority. You have about 60%, which is a slight majority, which has said, we do sell. And you have about 13% of companies, which again, are staying silent. Why is it interesting? So many reasons. One is when you compare that and contrast that to the Fortune 500, you see a paradox. Um, either the retail industry is more inclined to do certain selling activities, which may be the case or it may not be the case, or the retail industry has made certain legal determinations or legal positions that are different from how the Fortune 500 on the same activities. That may be the case or that may not be the case. I, you know, I, I can tell you subjectively, I have a lot of insight into this, having represented companies from the Fortune 500 who are on the retail side and who are not on the retail side. Um, and I think it's a mixture of the two. There are different standards, which I think are starting to emerge in retail that may or may not um, necessarily track compliance issues in terms of actual interpretations of the CCPA. So this is a word of caution, which I started at the beginning. Just be careful anytime you look at an industry to then step back and say, well, is it just my industry I'm looking at or what's the bigger industry? Am I a part of retail or am I a part of the Fortune 500? On page 22, I put what I think is just an interesting visual, almost an infographic. It's a heat map. So I started off by saying, when you talk about selling, um, you're supposed to disclose by enumerated categories what's been sold. So here, if it's green, it means it's an enumerated category and companies, this is retailers, on the left-hand side are on the y-axis. The x-axis here are the categories, the, the enumerated categories. So you can see even among those companies which sell, some have all red. That means they're selling every category. Others have one red, meaning they're not selling every category. And there's not a ton of consistency. There's a little bit of consistency over the left-hand side, which is personal identifiers. But when you start getting to the right, it really jumps around. 
So again, even if you were focusing on the retail sector, to say, well, the industry practice is that people sell information. That's a gross oversimplification. Once you start diving into what are they disclosing they're selling, you see, well, the industry practice is not that they sell all their information. That's a very small minority. Um, but there's certain categories of information that certain retailers are deeming as, as being sold or not sold. What else about selling practices? So does a company put a do not sell link? This is fascinating. Again, I've seen some people doing audits who've said, uh, you are being scored off because you don't have a do not sell my personal information link. And that's an industry standard or industry practice or a CCPA requirement. Well, the truth is it's none of those. It's not a CCPA requirement if you don't sell information. Certainly not an industry standard. When you look at the Fortune 500, 81% of companies did not put up a do not sell link. 18% of companies did. That's not a perfect correlation to how many companies were selling or not selling if you compare these statistics. So there's some other interesting things you can find out. Some companies sold and did not put up the do not sell link. Some companies didn't sell and did put up. And there may be reasons for both of those. But what you can say is when you back up, the vast majority of privacy notices do not include a do not sell option. Again, these are statistics from February. I think these have shifted somewhat. But my guess is that they have not um, flipped. In other words, I think this majority position is still not to put up a do not sell link. In terms of other interesting things from selling practices, and I'm not going to jump too much into it, but how you effectuate the do not sell link, you can find information on page 24. So some final observations and other observations I haven't talked about actually on selling practices. And I've listed some out on page 25. There's not a perfect correlation between whether somebody sells and they have the do not sell link. Some companies disclose the sale of information and don't include the link. Other companies disclose that they do not sell information, but do include the link. Most companies include a do not sell link, and I should say most selling companies do, well, many companies, but the link is not functioning properly. That's a um, unfortunate, but it's not an uncommon situation where there is a do not sell link, but it's questionable as to whether or not it's actually doing anything when somebody clicks on it. And then finally, some companies, but this is a minority, are geofencing. They do not sell personal information link, meaning if I approach it from Colorado, where I live, you won't see it. You approach it from Los Angeles, and you do. So let me jump forward and talk a little bit about cookie notices and cookie policies. I'm going to jump to page 27 of the materials. A lot of questions um, are around ad tech, and there's a lot of confusion about it. This is by the second area of most confusion when talking to people about the CCPA and benchmarking. So let me throw out some statistics. First, the greatest quantity of cookies, ad tech cookies, on websites within the Fortune 500 was about 40 ad tech cookies. The smallest, zero. Huge variation. Average, 8.1. The really interesting slide, though, is on page 28. This is by industry within the Fortune 500 what the average deployment of ad tech was. So you can see every industry uses it, but the extent to which they use it is just wildly different depending on industries. Again, something to be cognizant of when you're talking about how companies are interpreting ad tech, particularly as to whether or not ad tech is a sale of information. On page 29, and I won't jump too far into this, but I do want to emphasize, if you step away from talking about industry standards and you start talking about compliance, when you deal with ad tech, we've tracked 16 to 20 different compliance strategies, meaning is it the sale, is it not the sale? Do you use a cookie banner? Do you not use a cookie banner? Do you use a do not sell link? Do you not use a do not sell link? You could find permutation after permutation after permutation. It is not binary when it comes to ad tech. And an industry standard really proves this. None of these 16 to 20 different options have a majority, not even close. You're dealing with different strategies that may have three, four, 5% of the um, population. If you move forward to page 31, you'll also see another infographic. And I'll explain just what the colors on this mean, because I think this also just drives home what's happening when you start looking at standard practices. So again, this is a, a chart that has each of the different industries within the Fortune 500 in it. The color coding of it indicates on cookie banners whether or not there's not one, which would be blue, or whether there is one, but it's in an opt-in formation or an opt-out formation, which would be indicated by the orange or the greens. And again, what's the takeaway here? Wildly different by industry. There's some industries which the vast majority are using cookie banners. There's other industries where nobody's using cookie banners. And even among those industries where there's a lot of cookie banner use, you can find within one industry opt-in being predominant and another industry opt-out. The really interesting part of this is that regardless of what industry you're in, you're probably subject to the exact same provision of the CCPA, meaning if you're using ad tech, you're using the same ad tech companies, it really doesn't matter much whether you're a manufacturer, consumer goods company, 
a hotel, or a retailer. The legal issue probably doesn't change at all, but the behavior sure does. And that's what I wanted to illustrate on page 31. I've included a little bit more information on Antec because I know that's a popular topic of discussion, an issue where there's a ton of ambiguity and an issue where I think there's a lot of misunderstandings about what our industry standard practices. So with that, hopefully this gives you a far better sense of what's happening in the industry as a result of the CCPA. Um, this is something that we monitor all the time. And with Proposition 24, um, changes in the world, including in technology itself and ad tech, the use of a global privacy control development of the signal, um, these standards are going to change. So let me leave you with one final thought. Industry standards can be useful. They can be interesting, both to yourself, to your clients, internally, externally. Be very cautious with them. Um, not only do they not indicate whether something's compliant, they also tend to shift. Meaning what's industry standard practice a month ago, a year ago, or two years ago, is certainly not going to be standard practice within six months or a year or two years. So again, anytime you start trying to convey to a client, this is what the uh, industry is doing. Be sure to remember, is it accurate? What industry am I really talking about? And is it, um, has it been updated? Is it current uh, as of today? Well, I thank you again for your time and I hope you have a wonderful conference today. And I, I wish we could have done this in person, but uh, I, I applaud ISACA for doing the, uh, an amazing job of a virtual conference. Take care.